Sigma um, and Lean Six Sigma as it pertains to healthcare. So I'm going to um, share a presentation with you all. Can are you all able to see my slides there? Okay, awesome. All right. So um, as I said, I'm Dr. Uh, Melinda Hollinshed, as Chris said, and um, just a little bit about me. I am an ass assistant industrial engineering professor here at Mercer University. I am a certified Lean Six Sigma master black belt. Um, I have experience leading Six Sigma projects in various um, sectors. I've developed um, Lean Six Sigma training courses. I teach a Lean Six Sigma course here at Mercer to our engineering students um, in the fall of every school year. And um, some of my research interests are actually standardizing and optimizing the Lean Six Sigma curriculum and creating specific training curriculums um, to various industries. Because um, if you know anything about Lean Six Sigma, it's a, it's a broad um, application that can be applied in several different industries. However, all industries don't use all of the tools. So some of my research um, focuses on identifying specific tools to specific industries so that the overall curriculum can be optimized. And um, I'm also um, very interested and I also perform research in um, Lean Six Sigma within healthcare overall. So today I just want to give you guys um, a brief introduction to Lean Six Sigma. So some of you all may be familiar with Lean Six Sigma, um, but some of you may not and you may have heard the term before. So I just want to add some breath um, and knowledge to what you may already know. So what I plan to do is define Lean Six Sigma and its benefits in healthcare. And then I wanna define Lean and Six Sigma because Lean Six Sigma is just a compilation um, of lean, Six, lean and Six Sigma. And those are two separate process improvement methodologies. Um, and then I'm gonna, gonna go into a few areas or problems that can be addressed within healthcare in clinical and non-clinical areas using this methodology. I'm gonna share a case study where processes, where a particular process was improved using some of the Lean Six Sigma tools. And um, like I said before, I perform research, I have performed research in identifying optimal tools, Lean Six Sigma tools that are industry specific. So I'm going to share briefly share some of the things I've found um, as it pertains to healthcare and utilizing some of these Lean Six Sigma tools. Because um, if you know anything about Six Sigma, it is a um, heavily statistically based approach. However, those statistical tools are not always necessary to facilitate impactful results. So we'll talk about um, some of the more impactful tools within healthcare that can lead to um, great res results with Lean Six Sigma. And then at the end, um, I just wanted to give a brief roadmap of um, how to implement Six Sigma, Lean Six Sigma. Um, it's just, there's several methods or ways to go about doing it, but um, I just wanted to present to you a simple roadmap for implementation if you are considering um, utilizing this process improvement methodology at your organization. Okay, so let's jump in. <clears throat> so just a little bit about Lean Six Sigma. Lean Six Sigma, as I said earlier, is an integration of Lean and Six Sigma methodologies with the overall goal being to reduce waste, um, defects, which are variation, and increase effectiveness, efficiency, and also reduce cost. So the two separate methodologies have different focuses, okay? Lean focuses on efficiency, flow, and waste reduction. And we'll talk about the, 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 the lean waste in a moment. Six Sigma focuses on decreasing variation. So it wants your processes to be the same because that's what the customer expects, okay? They expect consistent and um, ser consistent service without variation. And it also focuses on improving customer satisfaction. So putting those two things together is where um, the methodology of Lean Six Sigma kind of come from, comes from. <clears throat> so Lean Six Sigma as it pertains to healthcare. So within healthcare, it can be characterized as a process improvement approach, which encompasses all members of an organization from clini clinicians, 
uh, operations, administrative staff, collective, collectively striving to identify and eliminate areas of waste and variation to provide a higher or better level of, of care. Okay, so we, we now understand what Lean Six Sigma means to healthcare. All right, so what I want to do now is just talk about briefly touch on some of the benefits of Lean Six Sigma in healthcare. Um, as I said before, one of the aims is to reduce defects, okay? And a defect, Lean Six Sigma was started in manufacturing. So a defect in manufacturing could be if I'm manufacturing a shirt, if my buttons, one of the buttons are missing, that's a defect and I can live with that, okay? But as it pertains to healthcare, a defect or an issue could mean life or death, okay? So that's why, um, I feel like this process improvement methodology is very valuable um, and useful in the areas of healthcare. Some of the other um, areas where um, Lean Six Sigma, Six Sigma can be beneficial will be shortening wait times in hospitals, clinics, and private practices, preventing um, slips, trips, and falls within hospitals and nursing homes, um, reducing medical errors when filling prescriptions and prescribing and administering drugs, and also um, increasing speed and efficiency of reimbursement flows. And that's just a few examples of where this methodology can be used to um, improve your overall operation, okay? So let's, as I said before, these are two separate methodologies. So I wanna go through an explanation of each one of them in a little bit more detail. So lean, helps to eliminate waste and remove non-value added activities from your process. And it focuses on creating value for customers, um, which are patients, um, based on eliminating eight lean waste and adhering to five specific lean principles, okay? So let's talk a little bit about these um, eight lean waste, okay? so. Um, the, the creators of lean, the lean methodology, um, identified initially seven um, wastes that they saw within manufacturing. So as lean grew in pop popularity, those lean wastes were um, able to be translated into other industries. So here are the eight lean wastes and a few examples of how they can be applied or where they um, kind of pop their heads up in healthcare. So one would be transportation, all right? And that could be unnecessarily moving patients or specimens or materials throughout a system. Um, inventory, that's another one. Having excess inventory, it takes up space. Um, it takes up, there's, there's cash tied up in inventory. And also if you have a, a significant amount of supplies, you have the potential for those to, um, expire and you won't use them. So excess inventory is a waste. Um, overproduction, doing more than what is needed for the patient. Okay, that's another waste. A defect could be a misdiagnosis, any kind of medical error, um, incorrect record keeping. There's waiting, waiting on the next event to occur, patients waiting for an appointment, employees waiting on workloads, et cetera, et cetera. Another waste would be over-processing. That would be duplicating work or performing work that's unnecessary. Um, motion, moving employees from floor to floor, room to room to get things done. Now, and, and let me talk about this last one, skills and human, human potential. That's a waste because if you have individuals in your organization that are capable of doing other um, more skilled jobs and you have them doing lower skilled tasks, you are essentially wasting their potential. So um, all of these waste, the, the goal is to reduce these waste. Um, in a perfect world, we would be able to eliminate them altogether, but um, the idea is to reduce them. Now, going back to motion, there are times when people have to move, okay, from floor to floor and room to room because of staffing levels and things of that nature. But the overall thought or the goal with lean is to target these wastes for reduction and ultimate elimination, okay? So when I refer to lean waste, these are the wastes that I am referring to, okay? All right, so lean is based on eliminating eight lean waste and also five lean principles. 
In 1996, um, Walmack, John Walmack wrote a book called Lean Thinking, Vanish Waste and Create Wealth in Your Organization. And in that book, he identified five lean principles and they are value. So the first pr principle is value and it's based on creating value from the customer or the patient's perspective, okay? Value is defined not by the organization, but by the customer or by the patient. So whatever the patient deems as valuable is what you should be trying to create based on this lean principle, okay? Secondly, the second principle is value stream mapping. So you want to be able to map the value stream that's mapping all of the activities that are used to create value for the patient or the customer, okay? The third, Principle is flow. You want to create flow within your organization, which means you want to decrease or eliminate all of the um, pauses, the stoppages, the work interruptions. So you want to facilitate flow, okay? We don't want to have any interruptions in our overall operational process. And this fourth one is pool, okay? And what it means is you want you want the patient or the customer to pull the services from you. So you only want to produce a product or service when it's needed by the patient or the customer, okay? And lastly, the fifth um, principle is perfection. You wanna always strive for, perf for perfection. The idea is continuous improvement, okay? So um, I had spoken about um, value and Lean focuses on creating value, okay? So in your operation, you wanna identify the activities that add value and eliminate those that do not add value. Those will be non-value added activities. So what do we deem or what can we call, what do we call value? How do we define value? Value is any activity that the customer or patient is willing to pay for, okay? Value is any activity that transform the products or product or service in some way. And also value is performing an activity correctly the first time it's done, okay? So the goal of Lean is to increase value and eliminate waste in your system, okay? So here, here are a few examples as it pertains to healthcare of some value-added and non-value-added activities. Okay, these are, are um, pretty broad, but um, in the operating room, a value-added activity, which is obvious, is operating on a patient. A patient, that's what they're paying for. That's what they're there for. A non-value-added activity will be reopening a patient to re retrieve a retained item, okay? Pharmacy, creating an intravenous formulation, a non-value-added activity will be reprocessing medications that were returned from the patient unit, okay? So we're, the idea is we want to get things right the first time. We want to try to eliminate rework, okay? In radiology, you could um, be adding value by performing an MRI. A non-value-added activity will be performing medically unnecessary scans, okay? Even on down to the nutrition services, assembling a patient food tray, that will be adding value. Non-value added activity will be reworking the tray because it was made incorrectly. Now it may seem small, but when you do this over and over again, if you think about the amount of time and effort and also dollars that are going into something as simple as reworking a tray and just simply eliminating that and coming up with a process where that, that won't happen, will be beneficial to your organization, okay? So lean at times, it isn't about making um, drastic, dramatic changes, but small changes in the right direction can over time have a significant impact. Okay, so we've, we've kind of touched on lean. So I wanna talk about Six Sigma a bit. Six Sigma is a discipline data-driven approach and methodology for eliminating defects in any process, okay? It can be applied in manufacturing, any kind of other transactional services like banking or insurance and healthcare. Um, within Six Sigma, it actually utilizes a structured problem solving methodology called DMAIC, okay? And that's an acronym and it stands for, number one, you wanna define the project goals and the customer, all right? So you wanna define the problem, what, are you, what do you want to fix? What are you trying to do? 
measure in the measure phase, you want to measure the process to determine the current performance. So where are we right now? All right. So after we define the problem, we want to assess where we are today. OK. And then in the analyze phase, we want to analyze the data and identify root causes for defects and issues. OK, so we, we measure where we are today. We then want to analyze the data that we have to see where our issues lie. And in the improve phase, that's where you work to eliminate defects. That's where you come up with and develop um, solutions to address your issues and problems. And then in the control phase, um, that's the last phase, you actually implement controls to sustain the improvements that you've made. OK, so this DMAIC process can be used to solve virtually any problem. Typically, um, Six Sigma projects last longer. Lean is a, a bit more about speed and it's easier. The concept is a bit easier to understand. Like I said earlier, um, Six Sigma is um, statistically based. However, um, there are tools within Six Sigma that are not that don't require any significant statistical knowledge that can be very effective for problem solving. OK, so again, um, Six Sigma is the goal is to reduce defects and variation, improve customer satisfaction, and it utilizes a structured problem solving methodology called DMAIC. So the overall goal of Six Sigma is to reduce defects, improve yield, improve yield. So you want to improve your outcomes and improve customer satisfaction, thereby overall increasing net income. OK, because if customers are happy, they're going to come back for your services. They're going to tell people about you and that's going to benefit you overall. OK. So putting those two things together, Six Sigma is about defect reduction and increasing customer satisfaction. Lean is about eliminating process waste and improving flow and also decreasing um, non-value added activities. So putting them together, you have um, the methodology of Lean Six Sigma. And I tell um, organizations, and anytime I give training, um, you should always try to start with Lean. OK, because lean can kind of lean techniques can kind of be used to um, address low hanging fruit and it's easier to understand. It's easy, easier for employees to understand. It's easier to train employees on. So um, I, I, I personally and even when I was in industry, I use lean techniques to address um, low hanging fruit, things like that could be fixed quickly and more um, complex, um, sophisticated problems. I'd use Six Sigma because the, the tools within Six Sigma are a bit more sophisticated. All right. So just to, to go into a little bit about belts, I know you, you probably have heard about um, various belt levels, and I just wanted to give a brief overview of the various belt levels. Um, white belts are people who typically just have, they understand basic Lean Six Sigma vocabulary. Um, they don't really work on any project teams. They're just kind of aware. OK, yellow belts, that's kind of I call that really the entry level um, belt level for um, Lean Six Sigma and yellow belts report issues to green belts. Um, in my experience, yellow belts have participated um, on specific green belt projects and had somewhat significant roles in data collection um, in those um, in those projects. So green belts are typically where um, the, the heavy lifting starts with the projects. Um, green belts typically um, lead Lean Six Sigma projects that are not really heavily statistically based. Um, their projects last maybe from two to three months, um, but they are um, able to make impactful changes. And most of the certified professionals um, in industry, and I'd say even in healthcare, are green belts. Um, there, there really isn't a need based on research and based on what, you know, the problems and issues that, that are arising and in a healthcare environment, there really isn't a need to have the extensive training that's required for a black belt. I've seen, I mean, some hospitals and organizations may have one or two black belts, but they may have four or five green belts, okay? And moving on, a black belt is a more advanced um, project leader. 
They do utilize more sophisticated statistical analysis to solve problems like hypothesis testing, regression analysis. Um, so, so these black belt projects are more involved. They're larger projects and they have um, more of a financial impact and they typically last longer, okay? A master black belt is someone who um, coaches and trains green belts. Black belts also coach, coach and train um, green belts, but master black belts are kind of like lean Six Sigma facilitators. They um, roll out and lead um, overarching Lean Six Sigma initiatives. They lead um, large scale projects, they coach and train, and they kind of function as mentors for um, lower level belts. All right. And finally, a champion that's really not a certification level, but project champions are just people who oversee projects and they make sure that um, black belts, green belts, have all the resources that they need to carry out um, the projects that they're endeavoring to do, okay? So that's just a quick view of, of belt levels. Like I said, typically within healthcare, the majority of the belts, uh, belt level professionals that lead um, impactful projects are green belts, okay? All right, so going back to um, Lean Six Sigma healthcare success, these are just a few of um, some project um, examples I found um, where um, Lean Six Sigma had been used in healthcare. And you guys can kind of, I won't take time to read through all of them, but some of the um, things here, um, everybody's always looking to reduce length, length of stay. All right, that's a big area where um, Lean Six Sigma can be effective. Um, this particular hospital, Virtual Health in New, in New Jersey, reduced their length of stay from six to four days. There's a reference at the bottom um, of where these actual case studies came from, these results came from. Um, down here at the bottom, Valley Baptist Health System in Harling, Harlingen, Texas, they reduced their surgical time and, and added capacity for an additional 1,100 cases per year, increasing their revenue. Um, by $1.3 million. So um, increasing capacity, um, having faster turnaround times for results are just a few of the ways that Lean Six Sigma can kind of help um, organizations improve, okay? So here are some examples of um, what, how Lean Six Sigma can be applied in non-clinical areas, okay? Reducing coding areas. A lot of these things, a lot of these issues here can be addressed by simply creating SOPs, standard operating procedures. Um, that's a tool, that's a lean, lean tool that, that's used by several healthcare organizations and really it's used in manufacturing as well because it's, it's simple yet very powerful, okay? Um, reducing billing errors. Um, identifying root causes for chronic claim denials. Reducing and streamlining patient check-in time and steps, all right? Well, the, what are the steps that are required to check a patient in? Everybody's doing the same thing all the time, okay, with, the, with an SOP. It can address things like this. Optimizing um, supply ordering processes, okay? I just spoke about this earlier as far as inventory is concerned. You don't want to order too much because items may expire, they take up space and they also hold cash, all right? When you order something, you've paid for it. So that's money in that inventory. And if you aren't consuming it, it's just sitting there, okay? And also um, Lean Six Sigma can be used to increase patient satisfaction, okay? A um, couple of examples for clinical area, er, areas, um, reducing hospital acquired infections, reducing readmission rates, um, and these are all areas where you can find evidence, specific case studies where Lean Six Sigma has been used to address these specific problems. Um, reducing emergency patient length of stay, increasing turnaround time of lab results, reducing patient falls. Everybody's um, always trying to improve safety for their patients. Okay, so coming up with a structured way to um, lay rooms out, to put things away, 5S, putting things in order, putting things back in place. Um, those things all can contribute to reducing patient falls and increasing patient safety. 
um, and also reducing patient wait times in various areas. We are all looking to um, reduce wait times in emergency departments. Okay, that's a big thing. Everybody's everybody's trying to do that. Okay, so these are just a few areas, and there are many more where Lean Six Sigma can be applied um, in um, clinical areas in healthcare. So now I just want to share um, a quick healthcare case study with you guys. Um, and it's a, it's a bit involved, but I want you to kind of see the problem that was being addressed. And I also want you to take note of the actual tools that were used to address the problem. Because like I said before, in a lot of, um, in my research, and what I found is that when you say Lean Six Sigma, people think about statistical analysis, they think about really in-depth training, and it's kind of off-putting. However, you can make significant improvements with um, tools that are, that are not really statistically intensive, but very effective, okay? So this is a case study on improving the emergency department cash flow, all right? So here's a problem statement. A not-for-profit hospital system noticed that many of its patients were routinely leaving the emergency department without providing complete insurance verification information or making appropriate financial arrangements, okay? This information was critical to ensure a timely and accurate billing process. So in addition to that, the hospital system was only collecting 30% of the charges billed for the ED patients that were treated and released and less than $300 per day in co-pays, okay? So this is a typical problem. Let's see what, what um, they did. So here's the business case. These are, this, this, these are the numbers, okay? An eight-week analysis of the ED gross revenue charges identified that 356,000 was not collectible because of incomplete patient registrations. All right, this translated into about $177,000 per month in lost revenue. The ED collection rate was 31%, so that means that there was a potential net revenue of $55,000 per month, okay? This could yield a positive cash flow or increased revenue of $660,000 per year, all right? This was all coming from people walking out and not paying and leaving um, the emergency department. So um, in addition to that, the hospital was collecting less than $300 per day in co-pays with the potential to collect up to $1,200 per day, okay? So that's the overall business case. That's the financial um, aspect that was actually driving this particular improvement. So some of the project goals were to increase the collection rate to 40% within six months by securing each patient's financial responsibility information before they were discharged. And also another goal was to increase the amount of cash collected from patients at the time of service from $300 per day to $1,200 per day, okay? So those are the project goals. So here are, to address those problems, these are some Lean Six Sigma tools and methodologies that were used, okay? A CTQ matrix, it's a critical to quality matrix. It was used to understand the needs of internal and external customers. Process flow charts. We've all seen a process flow chart, okay? That's very basic, it's very easy to use, but it's very effective. That was used to understand all aspects of the process and identify any gaps. Okay, so we haven't used any statistics yet. All right, um, cause and effect diagrams. This is another visual tool used to identify some of the major factors that were contributing to unsecured accounts. So a cause and effect diagram is a root cause analysis tool where you identify a problem and then you brainstorm different causes of that problem, and then you segregate them into various buckets, okay? So we'll, one example of a cause and effect diagram would be a 5M diagram. And you can look at man, method, machine, material, and mother nature. Mother nature would be the environment. So you'd brainstorm causes that were contributing to your problem and segregate them into those buckets, okay? That's what a cause and effect diagram does. It's also called a fishbone diagram. And it's also called an Ishikawa diagram, okay? So again, these are, and, and everything here really is visual, 
All right, you have a, a CTQ matrix, that's a table, a process flow chart is visual, and also a cause and effect diagram is a visual tool, okay? And finally, um, the FMA, FMEA analysis, failure mode effects analysis, it was used to measure the severity and probability of patients leaving without being seen um, and without checking out, okay? So I, it has probability there, but there's really no calculation there. You're just measuring how likely, the likelihood of that happening, of each one of those instances happening. So these four tools were used in this case study to facilitate improvements. So from an 18 month observation, the team identified patient arrival patterns and were able to sufficiently staff for peak times. Okay, so this was just an observation, an 18 month observation, they noticed um, patient arrival patterns and they were able to sufficiently staff because being understaffed would lead to, you know, people being able to walk out or, or people not being able, being fully monitored, okay? Using a Pareto analysis, a Pareto chart is just a simple bar diagram, okay? The team was able to identify the vital few X's and in Six Sigma, we, um, we identify the vital few X's. Those X's are the vital few causes that were contributing to unsecured patient accounts. Because um, just going, just staying on the Pareto analysis real quick, there could be several causes, several different causes for particular problems. However, most of the time, 80% of your problems are caused by 20% of all of the other, all of the potential things that may make them happen, all right? So 80% of your losses are caused by only 20% of all of the different things that could contribute to it, okay? That's why we call it the 80-20 rule, all right? So a Pareto chart is just a bar chart showing all of your potential causes and the impacts that they're having. And what you wanna do is target the most impactful um, causes or contributors to your problem, all right? So the team found that some of the main contributing factors to unsecured accounts were patient um, activity. Um, patient activity impacted the um, unsecured accounts. Higher patient volumes were predictive of a greater number of unsecured accounts. So more patients are coming in. We have more unsecured accounts. Let's have more staffing, okay? Um, patient flow in the ED. There were many ways for patients to exit undetected and there was no defined checkout process, okay? Checkout at a patient's bedside was inconsistent. So this could be mitigated by a simple SOP, standard operating procedure. This is what we do for every patient, okay? Everybody's on the same page. Another one, um, collected patient information was not integrated into the patient care process. Providers were discharging patients without involving the registrars and not telling the registrars when patients were waiting for test results. Again, what's your process, okay? If everybody's doing the same thing every time, a standard operating procedure, a lot of these things can be addressed and fixed, okay? So um, these are a couple of solutions that were implemented. Um, bedside registration of emergency patients using wireless data entry, central intake registration of non-emergent patients, um, a hardwired checkout process where all patients are to be escorted to the checkout desk, integrated clinical care process and registration, visual alerts. I don't know if I said this before, but Lean is a visual management system, okay? Lean seeks to identify or create situations where people can make decisions based on things that they see, okay? Um, Going back to number five, visual alerts to improve communication between providers and registrars when patients were available to complete registration. So um, these are a few of the implemented solutions. And if you, if you think about this whole case study, there was very, there was no statistical analysis. And I say that um, just because I'm trying to help you guys understand that Lean Six Sigma can be applied by a broad base of professionals virtually anyone, okay? Um, you don't need a, um, an engineering background to do it, okay? You don't need a, a statistical background to even do, to, to have um, impactful results. So a couple of the financial results, um, the annualized financial impact due to higher collection rates was an increase of $535,000. 
they were able to improve co-pays and yielded that, which yielded um, an increase of $73,000 per year. And the total annualized benefit was about $600,000. And um, I do have um, a link so you guys can go back and read a bit more about this particular case study um, if you'd like to, but these are some of the results. And a couple of the additional results and improvements that came from this particular project an enhanced checkout experience for patients leaving the emergency department. Um, all patients uh, were directed to check out. There was improved patient flow. Okay, lean is about improving flow. All patients see a nurse on check-in. Improved staffing patterns, okay, and assignments of registrars at the hospital. So because they knew when their peak times were gonna be um, for patient arrivals, they were ab able to staff better and staff more consistently. Um, and more clearly defined roles for hospital personnel. What am I supposed to be doing? Okay. If everybody knows what they should be doing, then you'll have less chances of a defect, which would be a, a patient leaving without paying or without um, checking out or getting all their information. Okay. So as I said before, um, some of my research um, is about identifying or creating specific training curriculums for specific industries. So this is just a portion of um, some of the research I performed last year with some of my students. I actually surveyed um, 125 practicing Lean Six Sigma professionals in healthcare. Okay, and I gave them a list of tools and I asked them to rate the frequency of usage for these specific tools. And that's why I keep harping on statistical analysis because um, that was one of the targets of my research. You know, are we really using these tools? Because even um, during some of my time working in manufacturing, I used, I've, I very rarely did a hypothesis test or a linear regression or, you know, there were specific tools that I used all the time and they were not those statistically intensive ones. So um, I surveyed 125 healthcare professionals, these are belt levels, all right, green belts, black belts, and project champions to, um, for them to tell me how often they use specific Lean Six Sigma tools. And these were the main tools that they used the majority of the time when they were doing their green belt or black belt, it's really green belt projects because I asked them to rate based on a green belt level project, okay? They use mapping tools. They make process maps and value stream maps. Okay, graphical methods. We talked about in the, in the case study, a Pareto chart, that's a graphical method. Okay, so they use charts and graphs to kind of understand and analyze data. They use root cause analysis. Okay, back from the case study, a cause and effect diagram is a root cause analysis tool. 5Y analysis, that's a root cause analysis tool. Um, they use control charts and run charts. Uh, also, descriptive statistics. Descriptive statistics, that would be the mean, the median, the mode, standard deviations, okay? No more than that, all right? Those are statistics that describe a data set. That's as far as they went with the statistical analysis. CTQ matrices, critical to quality matrices, um, that was referenced in the case study that I presented. Um, understanding different sampling methods. Are we using random sampling? Or are we doing stratified sampling? Okay, and then continuous and discrete data, that just means what's the data, um, there's measurable data and there's countable data, all right? You can measure blood pressure, you count patients, all right? That's it. So these are the main tools that those professionals, those practicing Lean Six Sigma professionals said that they use to manage um, Greenbelt projects, all right? Within their Greenbelt projects, these are the tools that they used, okay? So um, <clears throat> what are some of the motivating factors for implementing Lean Six Sigma within healthcare? Um, aging baby boomers, our healthcare systems are, um, the demand for care is growing because of aging baby boomers, okay? There's a rise in litigation due to medical errors. If you have standardized processes, you have a list, you're, you're less likely to make an error, okay? So you want to make sure that you're working to standardize processes. Everybody's doing the same thing all the time. Lean Six Sigma gives structure. When there's structure, there's less of a chance to make an error, 
okay? Staffing shortages. I'm sure you guys are all dealing with that, okay? Um, so if, if, and it's easier, it's easier to move people around into a job. And I'm, I'm speaking from healthcare manufacturing. If there is a standard way of doing things, if you move someone into a place where they haven't been, you can simply hand them the standard operating procedure and say, this is what you do. All right. So you can address staffing issues. You can't, it won't help you get more people, but it will make dealing with those staffing shortages easier. Okay. And then there's scarce healthcare financing. We've all um, heard about healthcare costs rising and, and things like that. So these particular, this particular methodology will help you identify inefficiencies in your operation to help you reduce costs overall. Okay. So I created, um, and just from my research, created a, a, a small or a high level, I guess, Lean Six Sigma roadmap, okay? Because launching a Lean Six Sigma initiative is a significant undertaking, all right? And it's not a very good idea um, to start large, okay? To, to roll it out over your entire organization. Some people may disagree with that. Um, I've seen it work both ways, okay? Um, but starting on a small scale can be more beneficial. Um, what you want to do is identify and prioritize Lean Six Sigma efforts based on some of these questions. If you're thinking about starting an implementation, okay, what is a patient safety problem or risk to solve? What are the most pressing complaints from patients? What are major, what major issues do, do physicians or other employees bring to your attention? What departments have been struggling and who is proposing large capital purchases or new construction projects? Okay, so those are some things that, you know, when you're, if, if you're thinking about implementing Lean Six Sigma or starting a Lean Six Sigma initiative and you have um, a large organization, or even if it's not large, if you want to actually pinpoint where to start, these are some questions that can kind of start that conversation, okay? Keeping in, um, in line with the roadmap theory here, um, in a survey, and I pulled this from um, a, a book I used, um, and I, it's referenced at, referenced at the end of this presentation. In a survey of 50 hospitals, the following areas were identified as common Lean Six Sigma implementation starting points, okay? So um, depending on you know, the answers to the questions that you had on the previous slide, these are some areas where, you know, you could start a Lean Six Sigma initiative, all right? Um, these are area, areas where people, where there are typically issues to be solved, okay? Um, so if you're thinking about rolling out or starting an initiative on a smaller scale, you may want to look at one of these areas in particular to begin with, okay? Um, medical records, that's super easy. Um, nobody's life is involved there. Um, and um, I wouldn't say it's super easy. It's not easy, but it's, it's, it's less risk there, okay? Um, not really dealing with patients, you're dealing with um, office procedures and, and steps. So that's a, a great place to start. Um, I've seen a lot of um, smaller organizations start in the lab, in the laboratory, okay? Trying to increase the speed or the turnaround of lab results. What's our process look like? How, how, like, how can we make it faster? Okay. Um, but whatever areas you deem useful and impactful, um, and, that, and, and I also agree areas that won't cause too much disruption. All right. Um, if you don't have a big Lean Six Sigma team, um, a big team of green belts or black belts, I suggest starting small and starting in an area where, again, there won't be too many disruptions into overall um, daily operations, okay? So um, <clears throat> here's, here are a few feasible steps that I think um, should be undertaken if you're thinking about implementing Lean Six Sigma in your organization, all right? You wanna identify a specific area for implementation so using you know, the, what I, the information I showed on the previous two slides, you wanna identify a specific area. 
you want to assess and quantify the main issues and set goals and objectives. Okay, what are our issues and how can I quantify them now? Because you want to know once you start, if you do start Lean Six Sigma in an area, you need to know where you started and know that whatever you're doing, is it making it better or worse? Okay, so you need to be able to quantify and measure the problem. And you also need to be able to set goals and objectives as to where you want to be um, once you've implemented these improvement measures. Okay, and, and this is super important. You wanna introduce the concept of Lean Six Sigma to your staff and employees to build the right culture. Um, I have seen Lean Six Sigma initiatives fail miserably because it was only done by a small group of people and no one else knew what was going on, okay? So, and there, there are several different ways you can kind of prep your, your employees or staff um, for a Lean Six Sigma implementation, just simply making them aware, okay? And telling them what's going on and even asking them for their input. What do you think are some areas we need to improve? What would you like to see? And that way, if, if your staff and if everybody feels involved, they'll embrace it and they'll support whatever you're doing um, better, okay? Because lean is about, it's gonna change some things. So you wanna make sure the culture is right and everybody's on the same page when you are facilitating these um, changes. And then finally, well, not finally, but then you also wanna train targeted individuals and staff for lean Six Sigma belt levels, okay? Who do I want? to um, lead projects and become and, and get trained. Okay, so you need to identify those individuals. And, um, you know, sometimes it, it may be good to say who, who would like to do it, you know, um, because there are people in the organization that are motivated um, to make change and wanna be involved, okay? And then you wanna, of course, launch your Lean Six Sigma projects. And after that, you wanna track your improvements and make sure that, that whatever um, improvements you make are sustained, and then you just wanna keep continuously improving, okay? So um, if you're interested in going further with Lean Six Sigma um, as a service to the university and our rural healthcare partners, um, myself along with the School of Engineering, we are willing to offer, um, if there is interest, um, Lean Six Sigma healthcare training free of charge. And um, after the training for those people that take the um, training course, if there's interest and if we offer it, um, there'll be initial project uh, consultation. So I'll talk with you through, and there's some other um, engineering professors here on staff that are willing to help. Um, we'll talk through some of your um, issues and projects and discuss potential tools you could use. So, um, if, if there is interest, and I'll work with um, Chris on that to try to gauge the interest in having um, a free training session, that, that's something that we are willing to offer. And um, so yeah, if, if anybody's interested, just please let us know. And um, thank you guys for attending the webinar today. Um, are there any questions? Yes, we can take a few questions if anybody has them. Uh, but I'll start off by saying thank you, Dr. Hollingshev, for your presentation today. And uh, we really want to thank the engineering school for their generous offer and Dr. Hollingshev for her generous offer to offer this training uh, free to our rural healthcare partners. Um, I know personally, I've been through the yellow belt training. I'm about to do the green belt training. And it's been incredibly helpful to me in a variety of processes that we've been involved in. So I can attest to the value there. Um, were there any questions? I see Wills Memorial Hospital is interested in the training. Okay. Okay. Yep. Well, if there, if there aren't questions, um, I'll let you know that we are going to be posting the recording of this session. I know a few people came in a little bit later. We know it's the lunchtime and you guys are busy. So the full recording will be available within a couple of days on our website at the link where you signed up. Um, I'm seeing lots of people in the chat. Great. We'll be emailing everyone who did sign up for the webinar today as we move toward that next step of hosting that training. So you'll be involved there. If you found your way here to our training today and and have not 
uh, signed up previously on our website. Go ahead and do that so that we'll have your email and contact information so that we can stay in touch and let you know about what we're offering. And with that, again, I wanted to thank you, Dr. Hollingshed, again for your time today. You're and, welcome. Um, My pleasure. We appreciate all of you for joining us and, and listening to the presentation today, and we look forward to maybe working with you some more in the future. All right. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone.